My background is, is feeding big factory sawmills. And so for me, firewood was just one of those things that kind of accumulated on the landing for a long time. And then I got involved with a, um, an urban utilization uh, grant through the Forest Service. And, and we started looking at, at um, all the different marketplaces that we have for you know, whatever that tree, that urban tree or suburban tree is. Um, and so highest use comes into play. You know, what we talk a lot about, well, we want to, we want to make sure we're, we're putting the, the, the resource to its highest use. And, and that's really hard to, to pigeonhole because it, it might be art furniture and it might be chips. Uh, it could be firewood. It, it could be standing deadwood. And it really depends on the, the objectives for the, for the landowner, the, the marketplace that's available to you. And um, and what uh, you know what the what the location is? Where can you? What's your access like? How far can you move things? How many how many art, artisanal people are out there that are making thirty thousand dollar conference tables? Um, so that it really there is no one correct answer for what's highest use. If we look at what's been going on um, in a in the urban suburban environment and in the rural markets as well you know lots of people are looking for where can I get wood so we're going to talk about where do we source the wood um, in the past 30 years or so a lot of things have been going on with our forested areas um, we've had an awful lot of people moving to the suburbs and and switching over from growing trees to growing grass and um, this is very common to have this kind of a of a change in the landscape in a very short amount of time. If you, if you pull up Google Earth and you, and you grab any area around a metropolitan area, this is kind of what you're going to see. This is just outside of Annapolis, Maryland. Um, and I do a lot of stewardship planning with, with, um, with landowners in this area. And, and right now, in most eastern states, most of the forested properties contain less than 10 acres. They're, they're a management nightmare. Uh, so foresters and land managers have a very hard time finding service providers and actually if you take that one step up lots of landowners have a hard time finding foresters or service or uh, land managers who are willing to work on these little pieces and so it's um, it's a problem so when I go in and write a prescription I may search around I've got a piece in Arnold Maryland that I've been trying to get thinned for five years there's nobody that can do it um, so there are real opportunities out there for skilled operators who are willing to provide real quality services. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. And it does, especially here in Maryland, it requires much more than just a guy with a pickup truck and a chainsaw. All right? It's got to be a professional thing. In Maryland, you've got to be licensed. Um, and if you're dealing with the folks with the million-dollar house on the 10-acre plot, they're expecting a level of uh, professionalism that's a little different than uh, Joe Farmer out in rural Pennsylvania or West Virginia. Uh, so most of these properties, before they were developed, they were cut in some, some respect. You know, they, they were logged. They weren't necessarily managed. They were, they were kind of hogged over in most cases. And so what's left is is the result of a high grade. So they are, they are lacking in genetic <clears throat> integrity and oftentimes species diversity. There may be, in this particular case, it's mostly beach. Um, it may be a whole bunch of just genetically inferior material. It's green, and most landowners don't know the difference, but, but uh, from a professional standpoint, they're, they're lacking. Most of the jobs really weren't done very well. So there's a lot of defect out there in the stand. You know, it's, it's easy to use. Fender trees get, get, take a lot of abuse, but I like to take those out when I'm done. So there's lots of opportunity to, to remove those trees from the stands and, and kind of clean things up. I'm a big fan of coarse woody debris, which is just a fancy name for dead wood. Dead wood is an integral part of a healthy environment. We really need it in, in our stands, uh, both standing and on the ground. It is habitat for fungus, for insects, which in turn are food for a variety of wildlife. 
they release nutrients to the, and, and make new soil, they, they hold moisture, they do all kinds of stuff. Uh, so when I go walking through the woods with the landowner and I look at something like this and I say, oh wow, look at all this, this is great, and they say, oh, but it's ugly. So it's, it's, a, it's a perception thing that we really need to work with and there's opportunities to remove a bunch of firewood on small properties if you've got a bunch of blowdown like this. Most folks don't like diagonals. They're perfectly fine with verticals or horizontals. Yeah? Do you need a license to clean that up? <laughs> what state? Maryland. In Maryland. Uh, as a landowner? No. The, the, the harvester, I guess, will go in and clean it up for them. Uh, you will most likely need, in almost every county, at least a, um, firewood. a firewood permit or a vegetation permit. Uh, a simplified grading permit. If you're not building road and you're not extracting root systems, if it's a very small amount, I hate to say this, but I, I don't ask and I don't tell. Uh, do it on a Friday afternoon. In Maryland, you do need the license. Oh, to be, a, to be a producer. Yes, to be a producer, you do. Um, from a from a removal from a forester standpoint, I don't I wouldn't mind seeing this one go and maybe the ones laying on top of it in this diagonal, for sure. You know that's th those those diagonals are pe most people don't like these ones that are that are farther along, more rotted down. Environmentally, I'd prefer to see them stay. You know it, it really depends on the landowner, and if you're working with a forester or a uh, uh, some kind of a, a resource professional, then you know. Kind of, you can you can mark down dead wood just like you do standing timber, uh, but it's important that you have a balance basically. So if there's a whole lot of it, removing some of it isn't going to be a problem. If you've only got one on a five-acre piece, you know, is it right behind his house or is it way back in the back? Can you back the pickup right up to it and just make it go away? Or you know, again, it comes down to the objectives of the landowner. I like to see it um, because when you look at it. There's all kinds of stuff going on. There is, there's a lot of life in deadwood. So there's insects going on in there, there's fungal growth, um, all kinds of chemical stuff. You're going to have mushrooms that are fruiting out of that from the saprophytes. This is amelaria, the honey mushrooms, very tasty to eat. Um, largest organism on the planet is an amelaria mat in eastern Oregon. It's over 3,500 acres in size. Uh, a lot of medicinals are, are um, growing on dead wood. So turkey tails, um, reishis, um, lots of other mushrooms are, are growing on dead wood. And they do make great nursery grounds for future forests. There's a little loblolly pine growing there and, and a couple other things coming up. A lot of pawpaw here taking advantage of the added moisture from that log. Um, logs will catch a lot of sediment. So if they're laying across the slope, they slow the water down, and so they catch sediment, and they keep, you know, they protect soils and, and all. They become uh, great highways for small mammals to get across large areas in a hurry. And blowdowns like this are, are really important because what happens when this root wall comes up, you, it's the beginning of a pit and mound environment. So when those roots come up, they, they till up the earth, and they expose new soil, and you have light coming down from above, and all of a sudden you'll get this flurry of green coming up on this, on this uh, freshly turned soil, and then you're going to have a wet spot down here, which is really good for amphibians. And if you are, and this is, this is the voice of experience, I, I salvaged some cherry one time, and um, when, as soon as we cut, cut the log off, the blasted stump popped back in the hole, <laughs> so we didn't leave enough on it. So you do want to be careful that you're not uh, shooting yourself in the foot by trying to get a little more extra value out of the stand. Um, so with working with, with individual landowners, working with a forester in their, in their stewardship activities, uh, great opportunities there for, for providing services there. If you're dealing with professional loggers, um, I've seen a couple folks running around in at least in, in paraphernalia from logging companies. Are there any loggers in the room? You are? Okay. Um, the important thing when you're dealing with, with professional loggers, what you're doing is you're giving them an alternative to pulpwood. So if you're far from a pulp mill or the pulp mill is packed full and, and they're not taking anything or the price is down or whatever, um, that's really your, your, your major
competition is, is with pulp. And um, that's fine. The big thing is you have to make it easy. If you're going to try to buy your logs from somebody, it's got to, you know, you got to, I was told one time that if you're, the, the key to sales is take their money and make it painless. Uh, or in this case, give them money and make it painless. If your logs are laying in their way, or if it takes them an hour and a half to get unloaded when they bring you logs, you're, you're not really a good, good alternative. Um, so it has to be profitable and advantageous for both of you. You know, the, the goal is to have a, a long relationship where everybody stays in business for a long period of time. Uh, there are a lot of opportunities with, uh, with thinnings and with timber stand improvement. So a lot of times state foresters will put up bids for, for thinnings and for TSI. Um, so there are opportunities for, for bidding standing timber and doing the work uh, or for buying those logs on a landing uh, that are put out. And if you're running a, a small processor like this, this is actually some of the best wood you can get because it tends to be small, it tends to be straight, and uh, it's usually in, in decent lengths to run on a processor as opposed to top wood, which can be a little, little hard to run through. This is a shot of a, uh, of a firewood thinning done out in Garrett County. And you can see there's still a fair amount of, uh, of coarse woody debris on the ground. And in lots of cases, the, the, the contractor here had, had spread the logs uh, across the contour, with the contour, to, to help slow down the, the, um, the water that was moving down this slope. He did a lot of that on his skid trails, uh, just putting the, putting the logs across them to break up the, break up the water. He, was using, he wasn't using a, uh, an, a skidder or a dozer. He was actually using an ATV, a souped-up ATV, and so he didn't have a blade. So he was doing everything he could. wasn't actually cutting road, but he was certainly having um, paths that he made multiple trips on. Insects and disease can give us an opportunity for um, for uh, for logs for our for our operations. Uh, gypsy moths certainly brought a lot of of wood in a hurry to sawmills as well as cleaning up um, dead wood for firewood. The emerald ash borer, um, we've got, we have, I was just upstairs at the, uh, at the APHIS talk, and um, it's pretty amazing, the, the, the chunk of the East Coast that is currently in quarantine uh, because of that. And of course, Asian longhorn beetles, another one of the, um, the potentials, not nearly as widespread as, the, uh, as EAB. The typical response so far had been to take those infested logs and just grind them up. Uh, this was actually part of the Maryland EAB eradication process back in, uh, I believe it was 08. And um, there were some really nice logs that came rolling into, the, uh, into that yard. I was, I was involved in that until they had stopped inviting me to the meetings because I, I was kind of the turd in the punch bowl. Uh, I was, I was the industrial forester who was asking questions that nobody wanted to hear. <laughs> you know, I was selling logs like this uh, for bats when I was up in New York State um, for great money. And it really, it hurt to watch them get chipped up. Some of those logs really weren't worth anything other than firewood, but it would have been nice to at least see them go into... This was pre-heat treatment. This was when it was a tiny, it was one county in Maryland, and they were trying to eradicate it. Now that the whole state is in quarantine, it makes life a lot easier and we can actually start to utilize some of this material that we couldn't back then. Uh, tree company logs, another opportunity. If Any arborists in the room that are doing both? Okay, I'm seeing more and more firewood operations set up on, on yards around. There's um, a lot of opportunity there. The, this was actually taken up in, the, um, in, the, in Fort Small, the Baltimore Stump Dump which Baltimore uses municipal crews, and it all came into one location and just got stacked up for a long time. They're, they're much better at it. When this was taken um, in the, I don't know, was it 2004 or five, it was, it was stacked, five acres stacked as high as you could go with a, with a knuckle boom with only enough room to kind of squeeze a truck down the aisles. It was impressive. It was just thousands and thousands of board feet of uh, millions of board feet stacked up, and most of it in weird six-foot lengths, yeah. Was that like a cold spring? Yeah. Yeah, I know 
You can see it from the highway. Um, lots of it is, is cut six feet long, and I, I couldn't quite, it took me a long time working with the, with the Urban Hardwood Recovery Project to, uh, to figure out what it was, and I was in Ohio talking to, uh, I don't know if it was Cincinnati or in, in uh, Columbus, but one of the municipal crew guys says, well, six feet's the width of a loader bucket. Wood is heavy, and you move the biggest piece you can move. If you're moving it with a loader, you cut it six feet so you can pick it up and move it. And that kind of explained it all. Perfectly clean, white oak log, 12 feet long, cutting two six-foot logs. Worthless as a saw log. <laughs> I thought that had something to do with it. They were making them cut them six foot so they couldn't sell them. <laughs> there you go. That was to, get, to make sure it wasn't going onto the black market. Um, like, like shredding the tags on the clothes. Uh, no, so, but, but there is an opportunity there, and, and you do need to kind of work with whoever your supplier is or with your crew, you know, and knowing what I'm seeing more, more um, tree companies also getting into the firewood or the firewood and in the saw log concentration market. So there's more and more of that utilization of the resource, getting it out of the landfills and figuring out, you know, is, is there value? What, what was costing us money? Is there a way to break even or actually make some money on it? Uh, concentration yards, um, there are several of them set up. There's one in Montgomery County uh, that we started back, again, in the early 2000s. Um, the D.C. communities were hauling wood all the way to Pennsylvania. And Chris opened up a yard and, and said, well, you can dump it here. So he was an hour away. And so instead of spending a whole day, they, were, they, were, they could make multiple trips in one day. And he got buried. You had a question? More and more, um, especially where they have in where the municipalities are are the um, ha have their own crews. Baltimore City has several um, grapples on on dump trucks. Uh, I saw a lot of them in Ohio. Uh, Davy Tree over on the shore has a grapple on a dump. Um, several others around. Yeah, more and more. And that was one of the the bigger problems with trying to utilize urban trees for saw logs was how do you get it, you know, th there's not an infrastructure in there to move the wood. And you can't just leave a 14-foot saw log laying on the side of the road for three days until your trucker from finally gets his act together to come get it. Um, and so that coordination becomes really important. And so I'm seeing more and more of that. Um, one, it's just, it's, it's faster than bucking it all up. You take it as big a piece as you can handle and, and take it off to your concentration yard and turn it into whatever else you can. Um, getting back to standing trees. Uh, crop tree management is a way of, of dealing with not harvesting an entire tract but focusing your management efforts on the best trees or the trees that fit the needs and desires of the, of the uh, objectives of the landowner. So you're, we're, we're concentrating that growth on the trees that meet preset objectives and that might be aesthetics. It might be wildlife habitat. It could be mast production. Um, there, there's all kinds of reasons why you might call that particular tree a crop tree. It might be that it's, it's a beautiful saw timber tree. But what you want to do is look at its position in the crown. Uh, the D's are dominance. They're the biggest trees. They're the ones that occupy kind of the, they're the top of the pecking order. Uh, the co-dominants are up there in the crown, but they're not fully in the sun. Uh, the intermediates are, are getting a little bit, but they're, they're really not, um, they're not, they're not taking up very much of the, of, the, uh, of the available canopy. And then the suppressed trees underneath are either trees that will never respond to being released, or they might be a species that's very tolerant to shade. Sugar maple, holly, beech, you know, those are th species that can almost grow in a closet. And they're just waiting for somebody to fall down, you know, and then they're going to take the space. So um, suppressed trees aren't necessarily never going to make anything. They may just have a very long-term um, outlook on, on survival. Typically, when we're looking at thinnings, we're talking about saw timber trees. So we'd go through and the, the crooked and the forked and things like that we would take out. A suppressed tree you really don't need to worry about because it's not competing with anybody. It's just kind of there. If we're talking about crop trees, this fork tree might actually be a great wildlife tree down the road. It would have potential to make a den tree. 
So we don't necessarily just try to make straight trees. We're, we're focusing our, uh, our attention on the trees that we really like for, for a large number of reasons. So typically, this, bur this big burned spot in this chestnut oak, that would be a tree you'd pull out. But if, you're really, if your objectives are not saw timber and you're really looking for, for wildlife habitat, this is producing a lot of mast. It's got potential den uh, space in it. And so this crooked maple back here might be a better tree to take out. And this old Ryby Beach might be a good one to come out. Um, as opposed to the, it, it all depends on what your objectives are. Uh, bad butts. Swelling is an indication of rot, typically. Um, old stump sprouts. Fork trees, these are the result of, of past harvesting. So those are root sprouts or stump sprouts. Uh, it's very hard to separate tight Vs, but big wide ones like this are, are pretty easy to take one or the other. Uh, it's important when you're selecting crop trees to know if somebody's living in there. This might be a very good crop tree to save and to give, to give some room to, depending on what your objectives are. So we're releasing these trees by removing the trees that are in direct competition. Once you've identified this as a crop tree, we want to look around and see, okay, who's competing with it? Whose crown is touching the crown of that tree? And then, and then removing those trees. So crop trees are in blue, and we have opened up four sides of each of those trees. And the rest of the stand is undisturbed. So you have minimal disturbance. You're focusing your attention and your growth on the trees that you really want to see. Uh, it's a great way to, to generate um, typically lower value wood, be it pulpwood or, or firewood. All right, so if we want to get into, the, in, into this, you're not going to go rolling into your firewood stand with, with, a, with a triaxle, or in this case, a, I guess it's got six axles. Um, so we're going to have to find some, some smaller. And Carl used to have these. He's got a display out here. Running on a two-inch ball on a three-quarter three -quarter ton pickup truck. Um, fully self-contained grapple. Great for moving firewood. Um, track skid steer with a, with a, gra with a um, feller buncher on it. Might be a little more equipment than, than most people need if you're not going to be doing an awful lot of thinning. But they're real handy because you can grab that tree and run and put it right where you want it. This is um, the military issue, military surplus ATV from Desert Storm. It was part of the working woodlot initiative that I was involved with out here in Western Maryland a couple years ago. Um, we were actually doing a thinning study based on, um, on firewood and small equipment specific for, uh, for working with small wood, and some old technology, a logging arch. Um, this can be picked up by one guy and moved around. It's got a winch built into it. You can back it right up over the log, pick up a whole, a whole skid of, uh, of wood and run with it. He moved some really big logs with that thing. I was really impressed. It's not fast. I mean, it's small equipment, and, and he can't lift a big log very high, and so he did have to do some things like nosing them up to make sure they weren't dragging on things, um, getting the butt up off the ground. Very maneuverable. Um, we were talking this morning. These, there were the, these were available, and now they stopped making them, and they're up. Now they're fourteen or $17,000. Is that what Jules said? They were quite a lot more expensive than I was thinking. They're... Um, they're, they're quite a bit heavier, and they've got a lot more uh, undercarriage uh, protection to them. A lot of power. Very, very low impact on the stand. <coughs> Part of the study was looking at um, uh, potential erosion from skid trails and from compaction. And this was, you know, this, this was putting down less disturbance than, than horse logging. It really, uh, you could run over somebody's foot with that thing, and you're really not going to do much, much damage. It spreads the weight out really well. Um, real good on side slopes. Biggest problem with not having equipment on a job is hanging up small trees. Big trees fall real well. Small trees 
tend to get hung because they don't have a lot of weight behind them. And if you don't have a machine with enough weight to pull them down, you end up chunking out an awful lot of logs. So uh, unfortunately, he's, Matt spent a lot more time cutting trees out of trees. Um, I'm not, he, he, by the end of the job, he was a much better directional feller than when he started. <laughs> All right, uh, that's the end of my stuff. Any other questions in the room here? Got to keep things moving so that nobody falls asleep at the end of the day here. Nice you bet.